Our final speaker likely needs no introduction. I had the good fortune to spend a day with her. We went from media interview to media interview. Uh, we met with some, some folks who work in the government. Um, and we uh, quickly attended a strategy session of, of the Our Waters Not For Sale Network. Um, and towards the end of it, she said, just make sure you keep my introduction short. Um, so I frantically scratched out um, a whole bunch of stuff from her, but it's still kind of long because uh, Maude Barlow is, is a person of some distinction in the, in the area of water. Um, she is the national chairperson of the Council of Canadians. She is also the chair uh, of the board of the, water, of the Washington based Food and Water Watch. She's an executive member of the San Francisco based International Forum on Globalization. She's the recipient of 10 honorary doctorates, as well as many awards, including the 2005 Right Livelihood Award, which is also known as the Alternative Nobel. In 2008 2009, she served as senior advisor on water to the 63rd President of the United Nations General Assembly. She is also the best-selling author or co-author of 16 books, including the international bestseller, Blue Covenant, The Global Water Crisis, and The Coming Battle for the Right to Water. She's also my boss. Please welcome. <laughs> uh, to be here. Thank you, Scott, for your gorgeous introduction. Um, I, I hate introductions. I, I, not that I compare myself in any way, but I once read that after a particularly moving introduction, Winston Churchill said he could hardly wait to hear what he had to say. <laughs> I always say people are going to say, well, she's not that good. <laughs> you know. So, uh, thrilled to be here. Thank you for this incredible crowd. This place is absolutely full, and I understand there's a game on tonight, right? So this is like doubly impressive that you guys have all left that to be here tonight. Um, and thank you, Ian. I don't know if you can still hear us, but we have a very full house here, 420, 30 people. And uh, thank you so much for your brilliant analysis and your hard work. Um, this is a real fight going on in Australia, as you can see and it's coming to a province near you. So I want to talk a little bit, just as background, to remind us about why it matters that we're having this conversation at all. Because if what we learned in grade six, all of us around the world, which is that you can't destroy water, there's a certain amount that goes round and round in the hydrologic cycle and nothing, nothing bad can happen to it, and there'll always be enough for all of us. If that were true, then it, I wouldn't terribly mind if somebody wants to make money from it, except that they wouldn't be able to because we, there would be enough that they that they wouldn't the price wouldn't be uh, able to to go up. But what we need to understand is that we are a world in crisis. In my opinion, the global water crisis is the greatest ecological and human crisis of our time. It is the first phase of climate change. And when you see refugees, food refugees, climate refugees, they are in fact generally water refugees. Uh, we have so many recent studies, um, one that uh, had a very intensive study, uh, uh, international study on rivers, just these are all within the last few months or a year at the, la at the latest, um, that um, shows that 80% of the world's rivers are in crisis, affecting five billion people. We have another study on groundwater extraction because we are pumping groundwater around the world far faster than it can be uh, replaced by, by nature. Um, and what we know is that what we're creating is, is, is areas of the world that are permanently running out. This is not cyclical drought, which we keep reading about. We read about it as drought, but it isn't drought. That's an incorrect description. This uh, new international groundwater study said that we are destroying the world's groundwater at an alarming rate because we are using technology we didn't have 40, 50 years ago. Borewell technology that can go as deep into the ground as skyscrapers go into the, into the sky. Therefore, they are pumping water at a very deep rate, at a very hard rate. Uh, they they uh, did a, the Canadian scientist working with this said, they, uh, the, one of the journalists said, well, what would this mean in, in North America? And he said, well, if we're pumping around the Great Lakes, just the groundwater pumping as fast as the global water, groundwater pumping is taking place, the Great Lakes will be bone dry in 80 years. You know, it's not me <laughs> worrying that this thing is happening. These studies are coming in now very, very quickly. Another very new study found that the demand for water around the world in 20 years will outstrip supply by 40%. 
And that may sound like just a number to you, but believe me, the amount of human and ecological and other species suffering behind that number is unbelievable. We are, we are growing crops in inappropriate places like deserts where we are actually destroying, you, you take a, if you take a, 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 an, an ecosystem or a watershed, an oasis here and a desert here, and you use your oasis to water the desert, soon you create two deserts. We need to understand that. We are over extracting our rivers to death. We are engaged in, in what Ian was talking about, which is this virtual water trade where we, where as we globalize everything, clothing and food and absolutely every part of everything that's in our world, we are using water to promote this kind of, of, uh, of trade. And so water is used in the production of commodities or whatever, and then exported around the world. So you're actually exporting the water out of your watershed, out of your community, and in fact, out of your country. We're also um, taking massive amounts of land-based water and sending it into great big 30, thirsty cities. And if these thirsty cities are anywhere near the ocean, they're dumping it in the ocean as waste when they're finished with it. I'm working with scientists who say that we're taking about 170 trillion liters of land-based water now and, and, and sifting it through uh, uh, big cities into the, into the oceans every year. And this is water that belongs where it was put. And we are playing God when we say we're going to take it from one place for our convenience or our profit and uh, move it around the way we are. And I actually believe that our abuse and displacement of water is as great a cause of climate change as greenhouse gas emissions. And we're, we were in Copenhagen at the climate summit last December and we'll be in Cancun at COP16 this year to try to tell that story because it's the untold piece of this puzzle. <clears throat> so this is not just out there. We come back to Canada, we have many, many, many issues, many concerns here. But just to specifically talk about Alberta, because Alberta is where you live and what we're talking about here, but also Alberta is the province the most at risk in terms of this global water crisis. And in fact, there are many, many comparisons between Alberta and uh, Australia in terms of the pattern of water use, using water to grow crops that are then exported away and then making <coughs> certain companies very wealthy a lot of what the Indian <coughs> excuse me talk about was the destruction of water through coal mining and and other energy um, uh, energy exploration, other kinds of mining. Um, so very very similar stories that a limited amount of water being abused very quickly. <coughs> so quickly here, the story is uh, in Alberta a combination of climate change. So you've got rising temperatures, dwindling glaciers, <coughs> less precipitation, more evaporation. We've got growing demand. The demand for water will grow 21% by 2025. And the population growth will be 4.4 million um, five years after that. And we know that the energy and petroleum sector is growing very quickly. Water demand will double by 2015 when projected operators in central Alberta are operating. They will consume 10 times as much water as the city of Edmonton. The tar sands use of uh, water now destroys half a million cubic meters of water every day, and that accounts for 76% of the water extraction allocation out of the Athabasca, and 8% of, <coughs> excuse me, this is just too many planes and too many talks today. 8% of all the water licensed in the province, and as it is, summer flows in the river have declined by 30% since 1970, and this is a very, very common story around the world. The Bogalala Aquifer, that big aquifer that goes down the western spine of the United States and produces all the corn and cotton and everything, all grown in deserts mostly, that is producing only half the food that it was um, 40 years ago. So within a few years, the tar sands will extract more than two and a half times the city of Calgary's yearly water consumption, just to give you a kind of visual example. Then we have virtual water trade. Virtual water is the water that is embedded in something that you grow or produce, usually commodities. And if you export that commodity, like grain or livestock or whatever, out of the country, then you're actually exporting the water with it. And the amounts that we're talking about, yes, it's not a pipeline in those water systems. You're not yet <coughs> exporting water by pipeline from the Athabasca or the the Bow River or whatever, but you might as well be because it's the exact same effect. 
We have a brand new study on virtual water in Canada, so these are kind of new um, stats that you're hearing tonight. They haven't been out yet. Canada is a net exporter of virtual water, um, 60 billion cubic meters a year. We're second only to Australia. Um, this is enough uh, water to fill the Rogers Center in Toronto 37 and a half times. Most of this is in grains, and most of these grains are grown in Alberta. Alberta, with just 2% of the available fresh water in Canada, is accounted, it accounts for um, 60, 66% of the, of the crops uh, grown with irrigation. So you're using your very, very limited water resources here to massively grow um, uh, grains for export. <coughs> These grains are highly water intensive, and when they are exported, the water leaves the community, it leaves the province, it leaves the watershed, and it even leaves the country. And our net export of water and grain alone is equivalent to the amount of discharge of the Athaba in the Athabasca River, in, sorry, twice the discharge in the Athabasca River every year. So this is an untold piece of the story, and I think we're gonna have to really grapple with it. <coughs> Excuse me, irrigation accounts for 43% of all water licenses in the province. And again, that exports, uh, it's exported away. For instance, between 50 and 90% of the Bow River is diverted for commodity production and most is exported. Same story for livestock and water use for cattle operations doubled in Alberta in the last 20 years and will increase by another 45% by 2025. Uh, Calgary and, El and Canada are net water export exporters of, um, of, of water through livestock exports. Same with mining, Canada uses and destroys huge amounts of water in mining operations and is a net virtual water exporter. Uh, we use up and abuse 1.85 billion cubic meters of water a year. Then we have the lovely new practice of hydraulic fracturing or fracking, and we've also already having our buttons, as you can imagine what the buttons are going to say about fracking off and things like that. <laughs> there is intensive exploration for this kind of, of uh, mining uh, of natural gas in, in, in uh, Alberta. This is where they pump intensively water into, uh, horizontally into seams methane, uh, coal-based seams, and so on, where they try, where they then um, extract the natural gas, but they do it using a poisonous toxic compound that's put into the water. And this, the patent on this toxic compound is held by Halliburton, so I was interested in the same folks who brought us the Iraq War. I was interested to see Halliburton is operating in, in uh, Australia as well. Uh, and, Canada's, and Canada is very involved in this in, uh, in, uh, in Alberta. The 15 wells in Rosebud recently were poisoned, um, and one of the brave uh, farmers there invited the media in, and she lit a, 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 a match and showed how the, the, the water goes on fire coming out of her tap. This uh, fracturing, fracturing fracking uses huge volumes of water, from 6 to 40, 40 million liters for a single fracking job. Talisman's Peace River Project is set to use as much as 30 million liters of water for its operation. And then, of course, it leaves these toxic lagoons behind it. Now, if you put all this together, what we have here in this province is what I'm calling, instead of a perfect storm, I'm calling it a perfect drought. We have the makings here of a crisis, and it is not a long time in coming. We have a combination of pollution, over-extraction of water, and huge increased development and demand. And this is a very serious problem. The only thing the government's right about is that they have to come up with a plan because there is no plan at the moment or a, a margin of a plan left over from their 1999 uh, Water Act. So they are moving towards, as you know, this, and as Scott so um, well expressed uh, the process here, piece by piece, incrementally, a full market system for um, the water question here in Alberta.